Hi, welcome to mini lesson 12. Today we're going to be doing only quantum mechanics and no statistical mechanics. In part this is a review, but I think it's a review of a topic that nobody ever really gets the first, second, third, fourth time they see it. So you constantly need to review this. Um, we're going to be talking about the quantum mechanics of the degenerate Fermi gas. And so what we're doing is we're trying to set up um, applications of Fermi statistics to real physical systems. And in order to do that, we need to develop some uh, basic results about how fermions behave just pure quantum mechanically with no statistical mechanics principles applied. So the topic of the degenerate Fermi gas is our main application of Fermi statistics in this course. It's the most important one for sure. It applies to so many different things. We'll say a few words about applications as we go on. Um, the degenerate Fermi gas is in Schroeder's section 7.3. We're not doing all of that today. We're actually just doing the quantum mechanical foundations of the degenerate Fermi gas. And so the basic idea that you want to have in your mind for what we're really talking about physically is conduction electrons in a metal, like a hunk of copper or aluminum or whatever. And our claim is that the electrons in a metal are very often well modeled as an ideal gas of fermions. And so by ideal gas, in this class I hope you've got the idea that we mean a gas where the constituents, in this case electrons, have only kinetic energy. And so the way to say this quantum mechanically is to say that the electrons act as though they are a particle in a box. Right? And so the particle in a box problem from quantum mechanics is the most important one to know. Uh, it's the idea that you have a region of space of size L, so we'll say it's a cubic region with side length L, where the potential energy is zero everywhere inside the region, and it's infinity everywhere else. So basically the particles that you're interested in are confined to this region of space, uh, but otherwise they have no potential energy and they don't interact with each other. There's no external fields applied. They're just moving around with kinetic energy, not really seeing one another. And you can solve this problem exactly in quantum mechanics. We've already used this result in chapter six when we developed the canonical partition function for an ideal gas. And it says that the energy of the particle in the three dimensional box is equal to this constant times the sum of squares of three independent quantum numbers, one for each dimension of the box. So you can rewrite this as just E sub n equals h squared n squared over 8 ml squared, where n squared is just the sum of squares. And so at first glance, you should probably be thinking this model is nonsense, right? Electrons in a metal can't possibly be like an ideal gas in any way. They all have negative charges. At the very least, they ought to all be strongly repelling one another. And that is certainly true, but <clears throat> it turns out that this model is actually pretty good. And it's actually one of the biggest surprises and maybe one of the biggest ongoing discussion points in condensed matter physics. Why can we get away very often with neglecting interactions in you know such a dense system of charged particles. Uh, so this model of treating conduction electrons as an ideal gas of fermions is due to Sommerfeld in the 1930s. Um, it's used everywhere. It actually agrees very often with experiments as I said. And so we like to in condensed matter physics understand why it works well and also that helps us in understanding when we do actually expect it to fail. It does fail sometimes. It fails often and it works often. It's possible for both of those things to be true at the same time. <clears throat> That's why science is interesting. So 
We're not going to spend a lot of time on the condensed matter physics of this model uh, and why it works. That's a, again, that's a topic for like a solid state physics class like PY552 and NC state, which you could end up taking before you leave here. A lot of, a lot of seniors will end up taking that course if they're interested in um, solid state or applied physics, electronics industry, etc. But for here, we're just going to sort of say, yeah, sometimes it works. It works enough that it's worth taking it seriously. So let's move on with it. So when we look at this gas of electrons, we call it degenerate. And the basic idea is that you've got all these particle in a box levels, which I'm showing on the left here, filled up, right? And we call it degenerate because the levels are really filled up densely, right? You start at the bottom, you can put a spin up and a spin down in each energy level. And spin up, spin down, and you keep going and you keep going and you don't skip any, right? And you just fill, 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 fill until you run out of electrons to fill up, okay? And so the gas is called degenerate because you've sort of maximize the degeneracy, the spin degeneracy in this case, of every possible fermionic level. So it sort of filled them as densely as possible in energy space, not in, not in, uh, not in real space, though often it does mean that, they're, that the gas is somewhat dense in real space. All right. So maybe when we get to the statistical mechanics part, we'll be able to make a, a distinction about when a Fermi gas would be considered to be not degenerate. But uh, this, this idea of just filling straight up, uh, respecting poly exclusion is what we mean by degenerate. <clears throat> so this highest level that we had to fill up to is called the Fermi level. So the maximum energy level that you get to corresponds to some value of n squared that's a maximum. And we just give that a special symbol, epsilon sub f for Fermi energy. So eventually what we're gonna do is need to sum over all the possible quantum numbers, right? So sum over all the states to do statistical mechanics, right? And so the trick that we often use, especially when we have quantum numbers appearing as a, as a square um, in an expression, is that we imagine an abstract space where the axes are made of the quantum numbers. So we have nx, ny, and nz, coordinate axes. And so we can imagine doing sums as an exercise in geometry in this abstract space. And you probably know where I'm gonna go with this because we've done this a few times now. We've done, uh, back in chapter two, phase space hypersphere geometry. Uh, in chapter six, when we did the Maxwell speed distribution, we did velocity space geometry. And so now we're basically doing particle in a box quantum number geometry. Um, and so the basic idea is that filling up to the Fermi level in energy space is sort of like filling up a sphere in quantum number space well, the issue is it's we only fill up one eighth of the sphere, the positive octant, because all of the quantum numbers n sub x, n sub y, and n sub z in the problem are required to be bigger than or equal to zero. So it's not the full sphere, even though I drew it here. I'd be a little bit lazy with my drawings. It was actually hard to get a good looking, good looking octant. <clears throat> Uh, so the basic idea is that each set of each point in X and Y and Z is a possible state and all the points in the first octant um, in this spherical volume correspond to states of the degenerate Fermi gas. And so if we have N, capital N electrons in the solid, the number of electrons in the solid has to be equal to twice times the positive octant volume of this sphere. So the twice comes from the fact that uh, for every nx, ny, and z uh, triple, I can put two spins in that state. Right? So there's a, there's a two-fold spin degeneracy for every set of quantum numbers here. But otherwise, it's straightforward, right? So positive, 
positive octant volume of the sphere is 1 8 4 pi r cubed over 3 where r is the n max value uh, and so you just calculate that through with the 2 and you get pi n cubed max divided by 3 has to equal the number of electrons in the solid <coughs> So that's pretty good. Uh, well, we're going to use this again in a minute. A couple things that are important here. So what have we done? Within this analysis, we have inserted two physics, I, physics ideas. I don't, maybe we shouldn't say principles, but physics ideas. Number one, the, the form of the energy eigenvalues, the energy states for the particle in a box uh, permits the use of a spherical geometry by virtue of this n squared appearing, right? It looks like a radius squared. And number two, we've included spin degeneracy already in here. So this expression, capital N equals pi n max cubed over three, has both the quantum mechanics of the particle in a box and Pauli exclusion already in it. <coughs> Sorry. So let's combine this expression with the expression for the Fermi energy up here. You just basically sub in for n max in terms of total number of electrons n. And what you get is that the Fermi energy is equal to a constant times 3n over pi v all to the 2 3rd power. So the important result here is that the Fermi energy of a degenerate Fermi gas is only determined by the number density of the fermions. That's a really interesting and important and simple result, right? So number density is number of fermions per unit volume. If you know that, you know the Fermi energy, right? So you've got a hunk of copper, you know how many atoms there are, you know, maybe maybe you know how many valence electrons contribute to the to the conduction electrons in the copper. And from that you pretty much already know the Fermi energy of the hunk of copper. <coughs> The same is even true, say, for nuclei, right? You've got a bunch of protons and a bunch of neutrons inside a nucleus. You know the number density of the nucleus, like assume the nucleus is a sphere, which is an okay approximation. And so therefore you know the Fermi energy of the nucleus. Really important and key result. So we're still not completely done here. All we did, all we did was get a, a nice result for uh, the Fermi energy in terms of the number density, but what we really want to do is count states, right? And so since we have a very large number of fermions typically in a StatMec problem, uh, we really don't want to do this counting directly. Uh, we'd rather like to say there are essentially an infinite number of states and we're going to treat the states as a continuum and track them by a, a density function. So in other words, we want to define a density of states, sometimes I'll call it the DOS, that counts how many states there are per unit energy. <coughs> Jeez, some water or something. Excuse me. Uh, so I'm going to call the DOS, the density of states G, as a function of energy. And it's going to be the rate of change of the number of states per unit energy. So n is the number of particles from our previous notation, but for fermions there's one particle per state, and so this is an easy substitution. So we've got two equations to address this uh, derivative with. We know uh, how the energy behaves as a function of quantum number n squared, and we know how the number of states has to depend on n cubed. So we can use the chain rule to say that d big N with respect to E is equal to d big N with respect to little n, d little n with respect to little e. And so let's just do those calculations. d big N with respect to little n is pi n squared. I want a function of energy in G, so I'm going to convert this n squared into an energy by direct substitution from the energy formula. So that's 8 ml squared e over h squared. And then dn, d little n, d e is easy. That's just a half times this expression, 
times one over the square root of energy. <clears throat> and so we just combine this expression multiplied through by this expression and you get that the density of states of a degenerate Fermi gas is pi times the volume 8m to the 3 halves over 2h cubed and importantly it scales as the square root of energy. Right? So this tells us that as we go up in energy the number of states per unit energy is growing um, it's growing as the square root. So it's actually a somewhat weak growth, but it's definitely a, a growth. So let's see how this looks for a specific case. Again, I just want to always have in my mind this idea of electrons in copper. The mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. This is a dangerous point when you're doing calculations in degenerate Fermi gas, right? Copper metal, you see that and you immediately go to the periodic table and look up the atomic mass of copper. That is not what we're talking about. In this case, we're talking about electrons in copper metal, so we use the mass of the electron. Okay? So don't get don't get distracted by the idea that it's in copper. Let's say we have a cubic centimeter of volume, so that's 10 to the minus 6 cubic meters. Uh, and it turns out that the density of conduction electrons in copper, I just looked this up from one of my condensed matter physics textbooks is 8.49 times 10 to the 28th electrons per cubic meter. So we can calculate the Fermi energy for copper using this expression from the density and that basically gives you seven electron volts. And so then what I did is to just plot the density of states as a function of energy in units of one over electron volts. So this is that square root function. It's like a sideways parabola. So it's growing not even quite linearly with energy. It's, it's sublinear. Um, and then the Fermi energy at 7 eV, this red dashed line, separates states that are occupied from states that are unoccupied. Okay. And so what we're going to do, and I think the really important point to keep in mind here is that all we've done is quantum mechanics. Even though we did develop this idea of a density of states, which feels kind of stat mech y because we're, you know, we're saying we got a large number and we want to we wanna count by using a continuum approximation, it's not really statistical mechanics. We haven't used anything like a partition function or thermodynamic definitions or you know, fundamental assumption of, of statistical mechanics. We've only used quantum principles to develop this. And so our basic idea for the next time is that we're going to take this density of states to be our subsystem in the grand canonical ensemble and we're going to ask if you couple the subsystem to a large reservoir at temperature t and chemical potential mu what do you get so it's actually going to slightly change the occupation because you're going to have not only the quantum occupation set by the density of states but now you're going to have the thermal occupation set by the Fermi-Dirac distribution function, okay? And it's a pretty difficult, it's, it's actually somewhat difficult mathematically to deal with this, but conceptually it's, it's straightforward. Now, instead of imagining a single level as the subsystem in the Grand Canonical Ensemble, we're going to use a density of states as the subsystem conceptually in the Grand Canonical Ensemble. All right, so we'll talk with you about the statistical mechanics of the degenerate Fermi gas in the next mini lesson.